What child is this? And that's why we are here today. This child is the Word of God, is the King of King and Lord of Lord. And with that, I want to say welcome. If you're visiting with us for the first time, I hope you find yourself amongst family and friends and uh, we would get to meet you and know you. So a very, very big, hearty welcome on this frozen morning. Um, you never, America would never have to nuke the Middle East. Just bring this weather over to the Middle East and no one will come out, okay? <laughs> Arabs don't do cold weather. So, and I'm freezing. So, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones said the chief end of every preacher and every sermon is to bring a sense of God to the hearer. And I pray, I hope, God would do that for us this morning. So with that, let me uh, lead us into a word of prayer and that we can go to the throne of grace and plead for the Lord to um, be with us this morning. Father, we thank you. We come to you with sweet adoration and we are in awe and in wonder of the child who is God, who is Lord, who has come that we might come to you. And so to that we say thank you and, and, and bless and bless your name. Father, we ask that today you would meet us by, in, and through your Spirit, you would meet us in a very special, very personal way that the Word of God would come to the depth of our hearts. And we thank you. We thank you for him. In Christ's name, we pray. Thank you. If you would take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John chapter 1, um, we will take up verses 1 through 4 and then part of verse 14 and the theme will be the Word of God. What child is this? This child is the Word of God. And, uh, and next week, Lord willing, Robert Davis will bring the remainder of verse 14 in chapter 1. If you were to ask John the Evangelist, or John the Apostle, what child is this as we sang this morning if you were to ask him he would say i'll tell you what child is this before before christ's birth before any earthly ministry before any sermon before any miracle before calvary before the cross before the creation of the nation before time before space before energy before matter as a matter of fact, he says, let me pull the curtain backs back a little bit into eternity. And he says, I'll tell you what this child, who this child is. This is my, this is my prologue. This is my preface to my gospel. And I want you to get this right, he's saying. And so if you would read with me, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into your being. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. So the Word is the main subject of this paragraph, of this prologue or the preface to John's Gospel. The most ultimate thing that could be said about Christ, about the Word, is right here in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And then he links verses 1 through 4 to verse 14, and he says, And the Word became flesh 
and dwelt amongst us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full, full of grace and truth. And so he says, this word became flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone. So John says, this child who is, he would say, this child who is in the manger is bigger, greater, beyond, better than any of this world can hold together. So the Gospel of John is very, very unique. It's unlike Mar Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He doesn't start with a child. He doesn't start in Bethlehem. He doesn't start in the Old Testament. He doesn't start in prophecy. He doesn't start with the Magi's. He starts in the eternity past. He starts with a person whose name is the Logos or the Word. The Word. The Word. Why the Word? Why the Word? Why Lagos? What's in the Word? And better yet, who's the Word? And so John has several audience that he's writing this to. And he's sort of setting everything up for his gospel to be received. So first there's the Jewish audience. He, they would have been familiar with the word of God. They associated the word of God with his will, with his power, with, with all his activities. And later, they didn't want to get his name wrong. They didn't want to take the Lord's name in vain in any way. So they substituted, in tradition, they substituted the name of God to the word. And so you get verses like Psalm 33, 6 says this, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. So God was personified. His work was personified in this word. There is another audience, and this is the main audience that John is reaching, is the Greek, the Greeks, the Greek mind and, and the Greek psyche and the mindset. To the Greeks, there was a simplicity of the word. There were two ways they viewed lagos. It was the simple understanding of the word. I have a thought in my mind. I have a thought in my heart. And I communicate these thoughts by the way of verbal words. And that's simple and that's true in all the world. They called this verbalized or the spoken word and yet the greek had a deeper understanding of the lagos that was much deeper more profound and more complex just as the spoken word it was the unspoken intention it was the unspoken reason it was the rationale it was the rationale that it's the principle that was unspoken that they felt this whole world had and yet it is not seen leon morris in his works he says the word lagos is the unspoken reason the rationale the inte intelligible it is the very most important part for the person it lies in the depth of his our own of his own soul to the Greek mind, they looked out into the world and into the universe, and they saw order, not chaos. They saw rhythm and rhyme. They saw seasons. They saw order, designed universe. They saw the cycle of the sun and the stars and the moon. What the farmer sowed, if he sowed apples, he got apples. There was a, there was an, an order to this universe. And as their philosophers and theologians questioned, they said, because there is a logos, there is this principle, a word in the universe, just as there is the logos, the reason within a person. So there is a logic, a mighty universe. In this mighty universe, there is a logic. They conceived rationality rationality and an ordering of principles effective throughout all the stoics said this 
they saw the universe as pervaded by reason and called this re reason logos. They saw the universe as rationale, even though they didn't think the logos was a personal being. But they knew this principal, principal being directed all things and everything. So when John writes, he says, in the beginning was the word, they can hang with that. They get it. They get it. And in, in a very simple yet deep way, he writes the prologue for his gospel, and he connects with them in the simplest, highest, deepest level. He says, the Lagos is the starting point. They believe the Lagos was the starting point of everything, of everything, of everything. So he will, John 1, 1 through 4 and 1, 14, John is going to connect with them in a very, very sweet, in a very good way. Second, third, there is a third type of hearers, if you will, to the gospel of John, and that is the Christians. Writing to the Christians, John does not want to take, for us to take three years like it did with them. For them in John chapter 20 to see the empty tomb and say, oh, I believe. He wants us to be right on the Lagos. He wants us to be right on the person and the Godhood and the deity of Christ. Right off the beginning. Right off from the beginning. Turn with me for a moment to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Get a taste of this. Mark 4 starting in verse 38. They were in a boat. Most of you remember this scene. They were in a boat. There arose a fierce gale of wind. The boat was being filled with water. There were, these were men's men. They were experienced fishermen. They were used to the hard climate. They were used to the waters of that lake. They were used to storms. They're not surprised by these things. But this one storm was very, very unique, very different to the point that it was filling the boat. They come to the stern of the boat and Christ is asleep on a cushion. By the way, the only reference in the whole entire Bible about Christ being, as a, being asleep is right here. There are no other references. And then they come to him and they call him teacher. Now, before all, even all this, they had seen him cast out demons. They have seen him rebuke evil spirits. They've seen him heal the sick They've, and speak to fevers, restore a, re a leper to a perfect health, heal a paralytic, forgive sin. I mean, he has done some extraordinary things so far. This is not a normal man. And so they come to him. He woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Kind of hard to imagine the disciples talking this way. In one minute, in one minute, he is laying down, tired, perhaps exhausted, asleep in his humanity. And in the boat, and the next minute, within one word, one exhaled word, he hushed the storm, rebuked the wind, spoke and subdued the raging sea, and then rebuked his disciples. And, and what was amazing about this is they said to one another, who then is this that even the winds obey him? John doesn't want us to ask the question, who then is this? He wants us to get it right off from verse 1. No other than the Lagos. That is John's point to the Christian. I don't want you to wait three years, ten years, twenty years. I want you to get Christ is God. Christ is God. And so John pulls back the curtains and he says to the Greek and he says to the Christians and he says to the Jews, he says, who is the reason of life? Who is the source of life? 
who is the logic of life, who is the rationale of life, who is the principle of life. He is not impersonable. He's not some force. He is God, the Word. He is a person. So John chapter 4, I'm sorry, John chapter 1, back to John. I want us to notice we've been going through biblical training here in our community group, and we see repetitious of phrases and words. Notice the word was appears six times describing who this Lagos was. So in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being, and in him, here's another was, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Six times, bam, 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 John does this. So, there, there are passages that you come to in scriptures. I don't know about you guys, there are passages like these. This is one of my favorite passages in scriptures. I got baptized, I think it was in 1987 at Grace Community Church in California. They said, what's your favorite passage? Bring a passage that you like. And I said, John 1.1. 1, 1. I love this passage. But there are passages you feel like you're on holy ground and, and you kind of run around them. You don't want to get into it because the, the more you get into it, the more you realize it's greater and bigger and, and magnificent and majestic. And yet they're so intimate. This is one of those passages. This is one of those we're treading holy ground because we're getting into the very nature, the very nature of God. So here is his essence. Give this a try. Here is his essence. Here is his nature. The gospel opens up so right on the scene. John opens up the curtains and he says, in the beginning was the word. He is the word of God. In the beginning was the word. The statement does not refer to a, a start, but to a, an infinite state. Before there was a beginning the Word had been there. The focus of this is the eternality of the Word of God. And then he says, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God, sorry. And the Word was God. He is very divine of very defined. Not, not some lower order, not a force, not a higher angel like the Jehovah Witnesses would like to tell us. Not a God, not a sub-God. God won't tolerate that. They share the same godhood, the same nature. And, there, and in the Gospel of John, there's no vagueness about this. There's no neutrality about Christ. He is God. And what makes God, God? What makes God, God? He is all other than anything else we know. He is unlike anything we know. That's what makes God, God. Very God of very God. His essence, His nature, His attributes, His power, His position, His place at the throne, His name, His character, His claims, His works. Everything about the Word cries out, God of very God. No mistakes here. No ifs or buts. Calvin says He is above the world and all creature and he is before all ages. He is above and before. That's what makes Christ God. His relationship to God and the word was with God. And it's repeated again in verse 2 in case you don't mistake anything with this. And, the, and, and, and he repeats this. And the word in, was in the beginning with God. This, this idea of proston theon with God, or, or literally he was toward God. Literally the word could mean he was face to face with God. It's, it doesn't say with the Father. It says with God. He is personal. He is distinct person. They're not one. They're two different people, but one. Not going to even go there. And so... Proston Theon, face to face. He existed in the closest possible fellowship with God. Right there, 
and by the Father. He is distinct, he is personal, and he is a personal being. Listen to Christ. There was, I never realized how much John 1.1 1, 1 had to do with John 17. Listen to Christ. Father, now Father, glorify me together with yourself, with yourself, with the glory which I had with thee before the creation, before any creation, the presence of the Son, the presence of Christ was there, of the Word. So with God, with God, He is, there is relationship. Let me make a bracket this for a second, just a personal application to us. You see the phrase with God? Everything, everything we know about relationships, everything we know as far as union and community and common union and all that flows out of that relationship. That's, we call that abiding. Everything we know about all the relationships are rep, that are represented in this room flow out of that relationship. Yes, weak, broken, sinful, fallen, Nevertheless, a relationship, a relationship. Relationship is in our DNA, if you will. It's in our DNA. So we're created, we're, we're redeemed, we're atoned for, we're purchased, we're forgiven for one end, with God, with God. And this is what the incarnation we will see is all about, is for Christ to come. And to bring us with him and with God. And that's the end of John 17. His high priestly prayer is all about. That they may be with me where I am at. So Christ the words listen to his relationship to the world. All things, verse 3. All things. All things is all things. Seen and unseen. He came into the being. He, he came into being through him. Speaking of the word, he is the source, he is the author, he is the originator, he is the maker of all things. There is, a, there is an ordered creation here. There is a logic. There is an intelligent designer here. And everything, John is saying everything, and he emphasizes that by negatively stating, and nothing, and apart from him, nothing came into being Every single molecule, every speck of dust, every drop of water, nothing was ever created apart from him. Everything. One other passage, I want to bring this, tease this out for a second. For by him, Colossians 1.16, for by him, here is the same phrase, all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And if I use, we, I'm in the construction world, and if I use construction term, here's what John is saying, and here's what Paul is saying. He says, he is the developer, he is the architect, he is the designer, he is the engineer, he is the contractor, he is the builder, he is the manufacturer, and he holds everything together. He is the glue, and he is the cement. And don't forget, he is the owner. He is the owner. And in him all things together. And the best is that it is by him, through him, and for him. So he was the eternal word. He is God the word. He coexisted. He is the uncreated creator, if you will. It is logical our fourth point, I love it, lands on verse 4. Um, notice he is the word of life. He is the word of life. His relationship to man. His relationship to man. He is the source of life. Notice verse 4 says, in him. In him, not, not, not through him. In him. In him was life. He is the spring and source and fountain in him before the beginning, before any creation, before time, before physical matter. 
Life existed because God is life. God is life. Life didn't begin with us. Life was in him who had no beginning. The whole theme of the Gospel of John, one of the main theme of the Gospel of John, is the whole idea of this. We get the word Zoe. We get the word life. 260 times in the New Testament, 36 times in the Gospel of John. He begins with the Gospel, life in him, and ends with this phrase. These things I have, been, have been written so that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. God is life. So I take this word in its widest sense, physical, spiritual, everything. God, if there is anything we get from God, it is life. Acts 17, 28, Paul tells the Athenians, in him we live and move and have our being. In him. Every plant, every animal, every human of all creation, everything preaches life. Life. It is more than just human life. It is spiritual life. It is a new life. It is eternal life. While rebellion and sin we brought into the garden death, physical death, spiritual death, eternal death, separation from God. The Lord told Adam, dying you shall die. The command and the warning was emphatic and binding that very day. Every funeral, we just had one here two weeks ago, every funeral preaches the wages of sin is death. While the Word created and brought life, we brought death, and we brought sin, and we brought damnation to our own selves. In Him was life. He is the life source. He's the physical life, the new life, the eternal life. Listen to 1 John 5.11. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in the Son, is in His Son, this life. We'll come back to this. And the life was the light of men. The Word is the, is the life, and it is the light of men. Verse 4 again. When life appears in the human heart when we are regenerate and when we are born again there is light life when re when it reveals when it comes it brings light it reveals life life brings light into the human heart and you can say i can i can see i can see i can understand i get it i get it where once we were there was a spiritual and moral darkness there is deception life comes in and brings light. And it was the light of men. It was the light of men. Up to this point, the Greeks, the Stoics, they would have said, we hang with you, John. He is God. He is the, he is the origin of all things. He is the reason of all things. He is, he is everything. Yes, we get this. Up to this point, we get this. Well, John drops a bomb on them, and he says, this logic, this reason, this principle, this rationale is not only personal, but notice verse 114, and the Word became flesh. He didn't put off his godhood, but he took on manhood. John would have dropped a bomb. To the Greeks, this would have been un thinkable this would have been unthinkable to them what do you mean pink puts it this way he says the infinite becoming finite the invisible becoming visible and tangible the transcendent becoming imminent and that which is far off drew near yes 
And, and John goes even a step further. He doesn't say he came as a superman or a superhero or this grand, great humanity. He picks the word, and the word became flesh. It, 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 it's got a crude overtone to it. We think of majority of the time the word flesh is used in scriptures. It's used in a negative way. It is this, we get the word carne, the Latin word carne, we get incarnation, and the word was made flesh or fleshly, and tabernacled, I, he became, he became the flesh of our flesh and the bone of our bone. He shared in our birth, he shared in our weaknesses, he shared in our joys, in our sorrows, in our feebleness. At times, he was frail like we see him in the boat. He got sleepy. He got tired. He was tempted like us, but with no sin. And he died a human death. He became a real man, real humanity, real humanness. John would say, we saw, we saw his humanness. We saw his submission. We saw his humility. We saw his meekness. We saw his lowliness. This was genuine incarnation. Nothing short, nothing short of you and me. And he says, we also saw his deity. Deity dwelt in a bodily form. We saw glory. We saw power. We saw authority. We saw sovereignty at work. He can he could rebuke fevers. He could rebuke wind and, 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 and water and, and waves. Here is the good news of the incarnation. I love this. Um, I never realized this. I was thinking through it this morning. Um, his incarnation, his humanity, brought dignity to our humanness. He brought dignity. I know in America we sit and say, I don't like my body. It's round, it's square, it's long, it's this. We get caught up for it on the outside. But God becoming a man, he brought dignity to you guys and to me. Our bodies, our humanness, he brought dignity to our existence. This wasn't an accident. This wasn't an accident. In all our misery and in all our fallenness and in all our brokenness, Christ comes and visits us right where we're at. <clears throat> That's why we celebrate the Advent. I read this this morning. <clears throat> Bonhoeffer, while in prison, following his arrest, Bonhoeffer would find a good analogy for the advent in the confinement and the waiting of all prisoners. Listen to this. Advent reminds us, he wrote, that misery, sorrow, poverty, loneliness, helplessness, and guilt mean something different in the eyes of God than according to human judgment. We look at all these things, we turn away. That God turns toward the very places from which humans turn away. That Christ was born in a stable because there was no room for him in, a, in the end. He says the prisoners grabbed this better than all others. He came to our misery. He came to our misery. Unlike other gods, other deities, Christianity is plausible answer and says, you can't come, but I'll come to you. I won't, God won't give us directions to, to heaven. God won't allow stepping stones into heaven that is so, 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 so offensive. He sent his son. We can't. We're dead. We're dead. We're dead. Second thing I notice about the incarnation is the magnitude of this cosmic eternal state. This hit me. I've read this passage like a zillion times, and this hit me. 
Do you realize Christ, who existed, I guess it's a word, zillions of years ago, and will continue for zillions of years, but 2,000 years ago, he took on our humanity forever, forever. He didn't just visit humanity, and he didn't just come on a mission trip and, and leave and go back. He came and he became us. He came and he became us. And thus, every verse, every story we read in the book of Revelation, you see his body. And you look at his body and he says, Beloved, this is what you need to look forward to. This is what the incarnation is about. This God coming, bringing dignity to mankind, rescuing us, pulling us out of this and taking us. And so forever, Christ will remain the God-man, son of man and son of God. Always, always. Listen to Jude, his brother, half-brother. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all times and now and forever. Amen. He calls him by his divine name and he calls him by his human name. And so, John 1.14, he came and he dwelt amongst us. He tabernacled. He came and he became to come close to us. He is the very, this, this, this Greeks were trying to get, John is saying he is the very expression of God. He is the revealer. He is the revelation. Somebody put it this way. He is, the, he is God's final sermon to mankind. Christ is God's final sermon to mankind. So why the incarnation? Why the incarnation? There are a lot of reasons. I picked a couple. And I'm going to do the negative and get into end this. In Islam, salvation comes through the five pillars. If you're good, also. In Islam, there is the confession, confess, pray, fast, give alms, and make your pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia, to the Mecca. And if you're really spiritual and you're really good, you can add a sixth pillar and become a jihadist. In the Christian faith, we don't have five pillars. We don't have any pillars. We don't memorize certain doctrine and scriptures to be saved. We don't come to church regularly, do good and give faithfully, marry a Christian and raise Christian kids and die doing all these things. We don't have pillars. We have a person. We have a person. Christ has come as a man to become sin on our behalf, to be judged on our behalf. He didn't come to set up pillars for us. He came personally for us. He didn't come and say, do this, do this, do this, do this, and you're saved. Hopefully. He says, I come. I became so you could come. Human works, spiritual achievement, external human modification on the outside, the cleanup job of yourself is literally, literally a, a complete denial and a rejection of the incarnation. Because the incarnation assumes human deadness and darkness. There are no stepping stones. There is Christ and Him alone. As trying to think of this, um, I have a heart condition because of my family. Um, they tell me my arteries are the arteries of an 82-year-old person. My widowmaker is getting smaller and clogging up, and that's not because of my lifestyle or anything like that. Um, they said it's, it's just comes with your family. It's in your gene. 
And so they give you heart medicine. And I can know all the facts about this medicine. I can make, know the maker of this medicine, the ingredients, the facts, the side effects, the effects, the benefits of the medicine. But if the medicine sits out here, it's no good to my heart. It's, it's dead to me. It's useless. All the facts, all the knowledge, if it's not in my heart, if I don't receive this heart medication, you begin to die slowly. You're dead. Cancer. Whatever it is. So, the fact won't save me. Works won't save me. Life, no matter how much I exercise and watch my food, sort of, during this season is really hard. Um, it's life and death. It's life and death. John 1, 4 says, in him, in him is life. Turn with me to John 5 for a moment. John 5. <clears throat> To the religious people of his day. John chapter 5 verse 39. He says this. And they think this is sort of applicable. I assume all of us are religious here. He says you search. Verse 39. You search the scriptures. Because you think that in them. You have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. In other words the scriptures Point to me, to the person, to the subject, to the goal. I am the goal, the subject of all these scriptures. And they point to me. And scriptures becomes, become a means to a relationship with a person. Scriptures and doctrines take the cross, what Christ did, out of them. Take Christ out of them. It is nothing but cold orthodoxy and a dark, the Bible is a dark, hard book without Christ. So 540, he says to them, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. So what's stopping them? What is stopping them from life? Who wouldn't want life? Verse 44, how can you believe, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? He says, you want to receive glory. You can't come to faith. You want glory and you seek this glory from one another. The, 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 the question, how can you believe, is a rhetorical question. How can you believe? It's impossible to believe if your spirituality is yourself. You can't believe if life is about you, what people think and how I project myself and I project my image and get glory and honor. Spirituality... Self-spirituality is toxic to living, fervent, vibrant faith in Christ. You can't see Christ in Scripture if life is about you. If life is about you. You're locked in. You're locked in on yourself. You're locked in. Your salvation becomes your own self. In the heart of hearts, he is marginalized and he compartmentalized. He must have it all. It's life and death. It's life and death. My heart is raw. The last two weeks, um, we had a funeral, the Davises and us, and you guys are so great. You came in and you helped for a friend who attended here, 27 years old, because of 
the deception of one sin, his life was snuffed. Everything was on the up. Everything was on the up with him. And because the lie of sin, life was snuffed out of him. Out of him. Sin and the self always promise life and happiness. They always come as a savior. Sin always comes as a savior. And says, do this. Oh, you, you'd get life. You'll get life. And we get duped by it. In the 80s, at the rise of the age, what was then called the age of materialism, the, the age of the, the uh, wealthy and, and the, and the well-known and all this stuff. Two men, this, this happened in California. I know all the fruits and nuts come out of California. I'm one of them. Two men were walking in a cemetery and they saw a man being buried in his Rolls Royce. And one friend turned to the other and said, now oh, that's what I call life. And, and there's nothing but deadness around us. And we're looking at this deadness. and we're, That's what I call life. It's wrong. It's wrong. Don't get duped. Don't get duped. The glamour of human atheism, the glamour of the new atheism, you know, it's life. I, t I tell people all the time, Without God, life is in a dark room. Without God, life is in a dark room. There are no windows to the past to say, I've been created by the image of God. And there are no windows to the future to say there is hope, there is heaven, there is glory. None of these. And so, is it any wonder when they promise freedom, liberation, personal individuality, they want you to have an authentic life. We're more faithful, anxious, more addicted to porn and pot and all kind of narcotics, more insecure, more depressed. Suicidal rate amongst the young is going up. I've been meeting with young men, unbelievers, because of this funeral. They're asking the question. They grew up without God. They're asking the question, what, what is my life is all about? I want to find the purpose of my life. I want, I want to count for something. Something inside of me is nagging. This can't be it. One remedy. It's not complicated. Life with God. Life. In the incarnation, eternity has come to us. So, where did the Christmas story start? Uh, two months ago, I preached to the Middle Eastern church, and I asked the question, what makes a Christian precious and special to God? There were former Muslims there. There were Jordanians, Lebanese, Egyptians, Syrians, all over the Middle East. I said, what makes, what makes a Christian precious? What makes him precious enough that God would leave his throne and come here? They answered all the right questions. His, the blood, the love of God, that's what makes us precious. I said, you're right, but there's something else. If you turn with me for a moment, and we'll kind of wrap up in this John 17. John 17. Starting with verse 1. I want you to see a theme running between God the Son and God the Father. There is a theme here, okay? Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, 
that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Verse 9, I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Four times, four times in this chapter, in this prayer, the Lord says this, they were yours and you gave them to me. They were yours, you gave them to me. They were yours and you gave them to me out of this world. He could have given him the world, the universe, galaxies, but he already had them. He could have given him angels, archangels, seraphim, cherubim. They were already worshiping. I propose for God so loved his son, he bestowed honor and glory on the son and gave him something else. The father honored the son with such gifts with sons and daughters that would look like his son. Dignity, right back. God loved the son and glorified the son and honored the son through gifts. And the son said, I'll die for them sent me. That's the gospel. The good news didn't just begin here. It began already in eternity past. Life, life is in the Son. So if God, Lord forbid me, I say this, if God had a tree, if God had a Christmas tree, we would be under the tree. We would be the gifts of God the Father to the Son. And Christ would be on the tree of Calvary for us. That is the incarnation. He came to bring life. He came to bring life and to bring it abundantly so we would be full of Christ and full of life. That's the Christmas message for us. John, in 1 John 1, he says this, same exact thing. From eternity past, the word of life appeared to have fellowship with us. From eternity past, the word of life. Is that good news? Is that good news? It is such great news. It is such, and such a counterculture news for us. Let's pray. Father, we... Thank you for the word. We thank you for the meaning of the word that is not some force, but he is a person who has come and loved us. And he said, I have come to give you life so that you may have life and have it fully abundant. So we thank you for this life. We thank you for his life, for our life. We brought sin, we brought death, and he brought life. We thank you for that, Lord. And Father, as we always, Lord, as we sing and as we worship, may your son be honored. In Christ's name we do pray, amen.